Okay, so this video is about the middle and passive voice in the present tense. Um, quick review, uh, if you're watching this video for my class, then you hopefully uh, know quite a bit already about how to analyze a verb. The code under a verb in interl interlinearbible.com kind of gives you the different aspects or categories of, of analyzing a verb. So if you remember what those are, verbs have person, uh, in Greek, that means uh, the perspective. Uh, so first person singular is I. It's the one speaking. I, I am in speaking in the first person singular. Or if they're plural, you know, it's we. We are speaking. So the first person is who's speaking. Second person is who we're speaking to. So you are in the second person. If there's only one of you, then it's second person singular. If there's a bunch of y'all watching this video, then it's second person plural. So first person is the one speaking, I or we. Second person is who we're speaking to, you or y'all. And then the third person is who we're talking about. So if it's third person singular, then we're talking about, then the subject is either a he or a she or an it. Um, if it's third person plural, then the subject is a they of some kind. So that's person. Hopefully that's pretty familiar uh, by now. Then of course, number. I've been talking about number uh, in explaining person. So there's singular and plural. Singular is if there's one of you. Plural is if there's more than one of you. I is singular. We is plural. She is singular. They are plural. Okay, so verbs have number. They have person and number. Um, tense. Verbs have tense, and they make us very tense. Um, as you recall, tense in Greek is not primarily about the timing. I do, I, you know, there are some who would say it's not about the timing at all. I do think it is a little bit, at least, about the timing. Um, so if you're going to say, uh, I am watching TV, I am watching TV, descriptive present, you're going to use the present tense in Greek. However, much more important uh, than the timing is the kind of action. I am watching. That's a very kind of continuous flavor to it, am watching. It takes two words in English to say am watching. It, but they go, both go together to express something that's happening in a kind of continuous or ongoing it's a kind of sense. Um, if I said, I watch, that's kind of simple, a uh, simple kind of action. But I am watching, or you are watching, we are watching, they are watching. That's, that's a continuous flavor to it. And that's the primary, primary kind of action for the present tense in Greek is, the, is a, a continuous action. Greek also has voice. I, not not so well named. What is what voice? What does that mean? But anyway, we're stuck with it from grammarians of the past. Voice is either active or passive. So is Ken Ken hits the ball is active because Ken is hitting, or Ken is hit by the ball is passive because Ken's not doing it. He's it's being done to him. So uh, that's the difference between active and passing passive. Then middle is a little both, and I'll remind you of that in a second. Then finally, there's mood. So am I making a statement? Um, or asking a factual question, you know, the light lights the room. I made a statement. It's indicative. You know, is it true? Uh, it's true now. The light lights the room, but now it's not. The light lights the room. It's still an indicative statement. It's just a false one. Um, so a statement is in the indicative mood. But there are other modes, moods, other modes of speaking. A command, light the room. That's a command. It's a different mode. It's a different mood than the light is lighting the room. Uh, then there's a, also the subjunctive mood, you might remember, probability. Uh, I turned the switch in order that I might light the room. In order that I might light the room, that's kind of a, a clause that has a subjunctive verb in it. Okay, little review there of verbs. What about this particular video? This video isn't about all verbs. It's not a review of all verbs. It is about the present, middle, and passive. So let's take a second and remind ourselves about the present tense in Greek. Again, it's generally ongoing or continuing action. Now, it can mean uh, the train hits cars. Okay, that, that, I mean, the present tense could be, be simple like that. But the primary kind of action for the present tense is continuous. So the, the train is hitting cars, uh, is hitting, you know, that kind of way of making a present tense uh, captures the ongoing or continuing flavor. It may be present time, it might not be. Um, but the, the, the continuous action is the more dominant aspect of the present tense. But it might be talking about something in present time. I did, as you recall in the past, 
Now let's go let's let's go into intermediate Greek level, the kinds of things you would normally learn in a third semester uh, Greek class. So there are, you know, so I get I get frustrated sometimes uh, when I hear a sermon that talks about this is present tense. It's it's happening now. Um, the present tense is much more flexible than just talking about stuff that's happening now. There is a descriptive present that's talking about things that are happening now. The dog is going after the cat. Okay, that's a descriptive present if it's true. Um, well, maybe, maybe it's a descriptive present even if it isn't true, I guess. But anyway, that's not important right now. But uh, there's also this thing called the historical president, present. That's where we talk about the past vividly using the present tense. So I'm walking down the street, eh? And this guy comes up to me uh, with this flower and he wants me to buy it. Now, I'm using present tenses there, but I'm talking about something that happened in the past. We call that a historical present, a present tense used of the past. You can actually use a present in all kinds of ways about the past. You can, there's, a, there's a futuristic present where you talk about the future. There's a perfective you know, present. Um, there's a uh, simple, anyway, there's all kinds of presents, um, which is why, you know, some would argue that the present tense isn't about timing at all. It's just about that kind of action. Again, I'm not willing to go that far. However, there are other kinds of present. There are gnomic presents. These are statements of general truths. Roses are red, violets are blue. I'm not describing something. There are no roses in this room that I can see. Um, uh, nope, there aren't any. So, but it's a present tense. Roses are red. So, um, so proverbs might use a present tense. Um, but uh, the fool says, you know, there is no God. I've changed the tense there. But you, you get my point that there are other uses of the present tense that aren't in present time. Historical present talks about the past. A nomic present gives a general truth that's a, just true in general, not necessarily something that's happening right now. There's even a durative present. Where you might say, uh, "I am your slave, and I I am serving you. I'm serving you now for six years." Well, that wouldn't make good English, but it would make a fine Greek. But we would want to translate into English as something like, "I've been serving you now for six years." But that could be a present tense. It's called a durative uh, present. Uh, there's a tendential present where you try to uh, do something, and you can add the words "try to" um, to the translation. Well, those are some of the, the different nuances that the present tense can have. So in beginning Greek, we say present, ongoing action, and present time. Well, you know, in, in, by third semester, that's out the window. It's much more nuance, nuanced than that, which is why, you know, someone who would say, well, Romans 7 has to be about Paul currently because those verbs are in the present tense. Eh, not true at all. In, fa in fact, most, most scholars don't think that Romans 7 is about Paul talking about his current experience. Um, anyway, uh, enough of that. Uh, voices. So, a uh, quick review of the present tense, but what this video really wants to do is introduce you to uh, the forms uh, for the middle and passive voice of the present. But, again, let's do a little review first. So, the active voice is Ken hits the ball. The subject, Ken, is doing the verb, hits. Ken hits. That's active. Passive, then, would be if Ken is hit. By the ball. Ken is not doing the verb here. Ken is being done um, by the ball, as it were. Um, so that's the, see the difference between active and passive. In active, the subject does the verb. In passive, the subject is done, you know, by something. Um, now, what about middle? Middle is somewhere in between, where the subject acts, but the subject is acted upon at the same time. So Ken hits himself. You know, you wouldn't actually you wouldn't actually need to have the word himself there in Greek. You could just put the verb hits, whatever that is, in the middle voice in Greek, and it could have the connotation of Ken hitting himself, even though there's no word for himself in the sentence. It could be implied by the middle voice uh, in the verb. But that, as we now will see, is only one possible nuance of the middle voice. I um, I taught Greek from a textbook once that translated the middle voice as Ken hits in his own interest um, to try to get the sense of Ken's doing something, but it's also affecting him in some way. Hits in his own interest. And so whenever it, whenever it tra whenever this textbook translated a middle, it translated it uh, X did Y or X does Y in his own interest or in her own interest. You know, the light lights the room in its own interest or something like that. So the middle voice is, is nebulous. 
To be honest, the first thing you should do when you see a middle is go to your dictionary and see whether that word has a, a particular middle meaning. So some words just have their own meaning in the middle voice. Um, so uh, take the verb arco. When arco is in the active voice, it means I rule. But when you put it in the middle voice, which is arco my, suddenly it means I begin. I begin, I rule, what do these have to do with each other? Doesn't matter. You just have to know that when arco is in the middle voice, it means begin, okay? So the first thing I would do when you, you come across a middle uh, is just go to the dictionary and see if you can, see if that word has a specific meaning for the middle. Um, that's the first thing I would do. Let's go a little advanced uh, on, the, on the voices. So that's the basic. The, in the, the basic is active, subject does the verb. Passive, subject is done by something. And then middle, the subject does something in a way that affects, bounces back on the subject. So let, but let me now go more advanced. There are actually two possible nuances of the active voice. The one that I've told you is the simple active, God rises. But there are some cases, a few cases, where just saying God rises doesn't quite capture the context. There's some places like, for example, in Matthew 5, where uh, Jesus says, uh, God, it literally says, God rises the sun upon the righteous and the unrighteous. But most translations will go, God causes the sun to rise on the righteous and the unrighteous. There's not actually a verb there for cause in the Greek. This is a causative active. The active voice has a causative sense here. And so translations are perfectly um, legitimate in, in translating it, God causes the sun to rise, even though it literally says, God rises the sun. So, so, that's, so there's the first third semester Greek, intermediate Greek, advanced thing on active voice. That there's actually not just a simple active, the one that you've learned so far, there's actually also a causative active where you can actually, if, if it makes sense in the context, you can slip some extra words in there like causes to rise. Okay, the passive is the passive. No, there's only one connotation to the passive, but the middle, if it's not, if the middle voice doesn't have some special meaning uh, that you just find in the dictionary, let, and, and uh, you might remember deponents that I'm going to come to in a moment. Uh, that's where the dictionary form has the oh my in it, and, and it's fake. It's a fake passive. It's not really middle or passive at all. It's fake. Um, so if, if the middle isn't a distinct meaning in the dictionary and it's not deponent, then here are four possible nuances that the middle voice can have. So there is a reflexive middle. That's the one I gave you as the standard example. Ken hit himself. The word himself won't be there. It'll be implied in the fact that it's a middle. Ken hit, and if hit is in the middle, then you might translate it, can hit himself. We call that the reflexive use of the middle voice. There's also a intensive middle where can himself hit. And again, the word himself isn't there. It's just implied in the middle voice of, of the verb. Uh, you, the word intensive, hopefully, is, is familiar to you because we've talked about the intensive use of the pronoun autos. And when autos is used intensively, it selfifies. It, it, and so himself, we're not surprised to find can himself hit if the middle voice is being used um, intensively. Okay, there's also a permissive, permissive middle. Um, can had himself hit. Um, and again, there may, be, there may be the context that may be such that, that you feel that there's some kind of a permission going on here or a having of himself doing something. Um, again, the context, we're not just making this up. You'll feel in the context that something's missing. You'll see, I have a middle here, um, and the context feels like there's a little bit more meaning than just the active. It feels like there's something more going on. And that's where you, you go to these sorts of, of other middle uses. Sometimes there's a reciprocal middle. You know, they hit one another. And there's no one another. There's, there is a word for one another. But let's say you can feel the connotation of one another there, even though the words one another aren't there. Well, the middle can have that connotation. Now, don't freak out, okay? Don't freak out. If, if all you know is... Active means the subject does the verb. Passive means the subject is done by the verb. Middle means go to the dictionary or fudge it. You know, just come up with come up with something that, that makes sense. Um, that's fine. You'll do just fine. 
If you don't know the middle, you can still survive Greek. The main thing is you know what the active is and the passive is. If you can fit the middle into your extra brain cells, okay. So again, just to wrap up the middle, the middle is um, one, either a special meaning you find in the dictionary, two, it's not a real middle, it's deponent, and I'll talk about that in a second, or three, one of these kind of nuances, you know, Ken hit himself, or Ken himself hit, or Ken hits in his own interest, or Ken has himself hit, hit or they hit one another. If it's just whichever one of these nuances seems to fit the context, if it's a genuine middle, that's that's what you go with. And of course, you know, in most cases, you're trying to figure out where a translation come from came from. So so in that case, there's some scholar who knows Greek better than us, you know, who's who's translated it in a certain way. And so you're trying to figure out, well, where did they get this? And you think, oh, this is a middle verb. I can see there's something kind of a little bit extra going on here. Okay, enough of that. So um, let's talk about agency and means. So when we when we put something, and this this applies to passive verbs, okay? When something is passive, there's often going to be either an agent or a instrument. Uh, so um, Ken was hit by Steve, or Ken was hit by the ball. So you can you can hear that whenever you have a passive construction, Ken was hit. There's often going to be some kind of a by expression or a by means of expression or even the word with can be used instrumentally. You know, Ken was hit with a stick by means of a stick. So when something is done by a person, we call that agency. So agency is when Ken was hit hupo someone. So hupo with the genitive expresses agency. So that would be hupo and then Stephanos, you know, or whatever, Stephanou, uh, Stephen in the genitive. Um, so, hupo with the genitive expresses agency, and it's used primarily uh, with passive verbs. That's if it's a person. Now, if it's an instrument, like a stick, then there's not going to be a preposition at all, probably. Uh, you might have the preposition n with the dative, but usually a dative of means is just a word in the dative. So, Ken was hit with a stick is you're not going to have a word for with there. You're just going to have the word stick in the dative. Now, I don't know what the Greek word for stick is, so I made it up. Sticko. So, sticko in the dative, that, see that omega subscript? You know, that's a dative ending. So, um, a dative used in this kind of context is often going to be what's called a dative of means. And, and words like with a stick or by means of a stick are going to kind of come out of the, the date of ending. There's not going to be a word for with there. And so, these are two important kind of categories that, that go along with, with the passive voice. Um, and if you take competencies exam, exams at some seminaries, you know, these will be things you, that might be a matching category or, or something that you would need to be able to identify. So, uh, agency is hupa with the genitive, and it's a person. And then the dative of means, or the instrumental dative, another way of calling it, is, is where it's an impersonal or a non-personal thing. Uh, Ken was hit by means of a stick. Okay? So, now, of course, uh, language is sloppy. So, I'm not going to tell you that, that uh, you're never going to have hupo, you know, with, with a non-person uh, and so forth. But uh, if, if we follow the grammar books, then when you had a person... As the thing doing, as the person doing it, um, Ken was sent to the moon by John. You know that by John would be who po with the, with John in the genitive, um, and then if it's a stick or if it's a rock or something by means of a rock, then you're going to have the word for rock, and it's going to be in the dative Petro. You know, for example. Okay, so these are two important things in uh, this chapter. Uh, now, what do the forms look like? Well, let's review the active endings. You know these well by now. O ace a amen et a usi. O ace a amen et a usi. So those are the active endings. O omega there implies that the subject is an I. Ace implies that the subject is a U singular. A implies that the subject is either a he or a she or an it. Amen uh, implies that the subject is a we. 
Eta implies that the subject is a y'all, a you plural, and then usi, with the possibility of a movable nu, suggests that the subject is a they of some kind. Now you'll notice that I've, uh, with the uh, amen and eta, I've, de I've separated the omicron um, and the epsilon from the ending. Now with the other forms, the omega, the ace, a, usi, the what we call the connecting vowel has has so gotten mangled in with the ending that we there's no there's no reason for us to try to separate it out. It's just it's so crashed, you know, that we can't we can't disentangle it. But with the omicron and the epsilon here, these are connecting vowels. And what we're going to find is that in Greek, now we're going to begin to pay attention to these forms. If a the connecting vowel before a mu or a nu is going to be an omicron. Um, actually, this was an on, I think an on C originally, maybe an on T, but the new, the Omicron was in front of a new originally, you know, kind of in the, the way that form got mangled into what it is. But what we're going to do more and more now is we're going to distinguish these connecting vowels from the ending proper, because sometimes um, we have, we're going to have different connecting vowels here. So technically, this Omicron isn't part of the ending. And technically, this ep epsilon isn't part of the ending. It's, it's the cartilage. It's the connecting vowel uh, that's, that's um, kind of holding the stem, lu, um, with the proper ending, men. Uh, okay, so what, I'm, what we're going to know now is that men is a active ending. Okay, you didn't know this, probably, but these endings that you've known for a semester now, o, a, say, amaneta, usi, these are active endings. Okay? So now for the first time, we're going to learn the middle or passive endings. And I have a song again I inherited from the past. I didn't come up with most of these songs. So in the present tense, uh, the middle and passive uh, actually look the same. On the one hand, that's nice because you don't have to memorize two different forms. There's some times where you have to memorize one form for the middle and another form for the passive. Um, on the one hand, I'm glad that I don't have to memorize two different sets of endings. In the present tense, the middle form and the passive form look exactly alike. The problem is, of course, is, well, how do I know when it's middle and how, when I, how do I know when it's passive? And the answer is context is, is basically going to have to tell me. Here now for the first time is the second of the, of the verb ending songs. Um, lu o mai, lu e lu et tai, lu o mai, lu e lu et tai, lu o metha, lu es the. Luan tai yai 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 yai. So this is the. These are. Pass middle or passive endings. My, tai metha ste and tai. When I see these endings, I know I'm looking at something that's either middle or passive. Okay. So now for the. So again, let me let me make sure you get this concept. I didn't know it before now, but now you do. If you see the omega on the end of a verb, or an ace, or an a, or a men, or a te, or a c, if you see those at the end of a verb, you should tentatively think, and I, and I should say tentatively, because everything gets messed up in some circumstance, but when you see oas, a, amaneta, us, you should think, I bet this is active. That should be your thought. Um, and the same way, when you see my, uh, tie, metha, sthe, or untai, you should think, huh, I bet that's middle or passive because these are the middle or passive endings. So my is the first person singular middle or passive ending. Tai is the third person singular middle or passive ending. Metha is the first person plural middle or passive ending. Ste is the second person plural middle or passive ending. And untai is the third person plural uh, middle or passive ending. You might, you might notice I keep skipping lue uh, the second person singular, and that's because it's a bit mangled. Uh, the, the the ending, the original ending, has gotten crashed, and I'll come back to that in a second. Um, notice that with this middle, with these middle or passive endings, I can distinguish the connecting vowel much more clearly, and you can see that in fact what I said is the case. That before muse, the connecting vowel is omicron. Before muse, the connecting vowel is omicron, and before news, uh, the connecting vowel is omicron. And then before everything else, the connecting vowel is an epsilon. Okay, so that's these are the connecting vowel. They're holding. They're the cartilage hoping the two car, train cars together. Um, 
Okay, so how do these translate? I have them on, on the next next page, but while I'm here. So this would be, I if, if it's passive, it would be I am loosed or I am being loosed. I am being loosed captures the continuous flavor of the present, sorry, of the present tense. But, you know, depending on what works easier for you to begin with, you might just translate it, I am loosed, you are loosed, he, she, or it is loosed, we are loosed, y'all are loosed, they are loosed. Again, these are passive. So I'm not doing the loosing. It's not I loose. It's I am loosed. I'm being done by the verb. And you might have a hoopah with a genitive. I'm being loosed by Chet, you know, or by, by Susie. Um, that would be a data, a, an agency, a hoopah with a genitive, an, an expression of agency. Or I am loosed by the dog, or I am loosed by the stick, or I am loosed by the window. I don't know what those mean, but um, that would be a dative of means in, in those cases. Um, a, a better translation to get the continuous flavor would be I am being loosed. You are being loosed. He, she, or it is a he or he, a she or a it is being loosed. We are being loosed. Y'all are being loosed. They are being loosed. Okay? Um, so that's the difference between the active and the passive. Um, uh, okay, now let me explain the second uh, form. So uh, originally the ending was psi for the second person singular. What, what happens often with these endings, a sigma that's in between two vowels, we call it an intercalated sigma, it tends to say, I'm out of here. I don't like being around vowels. And so what we're left with is the sigma goes away and we're left with an epsilon uh, and an alpha, and because of the vacuum, they get sucked into each other, and they go crash. Um, and so uh, there, are there are different rules for how crashes take place. It's in the policy manual. So with epsilons and alphas, whichever comes first wins and, be and is crowned a long version. So the epsilon comes first, and so it wins, and it's crowned a long epsilon, which is an eta. So now we have crashed the epsilon and the alpha into each other, resulting in an eta. Now we're left with an iota hanging out there while the iota crashes in the eta and hangs on for dear life as a subscript. You don't have to know what I just said, by the way. Some of you want to know that. Most of you really couldn't care less. And so for those of you who don't care less, just memorize that luo mai, lue, lueti, and a is the second person singular here. Okay, so we now have our second set of endings. There are really only four basic sets of verb endings. And we now have our second and we'll get the rest uh, when we do the next uh, couple chapters. So um, the the active endings that we've learned so far are o, ace, a, amen, et, usi, and now we've learned our first set of passive endings. Lu, o, my, lu, e, lu, etai, lu, o, metha, lu, es, the, lu, antai, ai, 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 ai. You might notice, by the way, that men and metha, these are similar in my mind. You know, men is active, metha is middle or passive. Um, and this also reminds me of te. Remember, te is active. Ste is passive. So, you know, that I don't know. It helps me. Um, now, middle, what would the middle translation? Well, that, that one grammar I used would translate it, I am loosing in my own interest, if it was middle. You are loosing in your own interest. Uh, but you could also translate it, I, I am loosing myself, or you are loosing yourself. You know, what again, what the middle means, one, look in the dictionary and see if there's a special meaning for the middle of that word. Two, it could be deponent. Wait, wait for it. It's coming. Um, if it's a genuine middle, then you have to find what the nuance is. Is it I loose myself? Is it I am loosing in my own interest? Is it I myself loose? Is it uh, we are loosing one another? Um, is it I, I'm having myself loosed? You know, what's the, what is the middle connotation? That's kind of advanced. That's, that's beyond beginning Greek. So don't worry if you don't quite have that down. Okay, now, what is the translation of the passive? I already told you, but here it is in writing. So I am loosed, or preferably I am being loosed, to get that continuous flavor of the present tense. You are loosed, or preferably you are being loosed. Um, Luatai, a he, a she, or an it is loosed, or is being loosed. Um, we are loosed, or even better, we are being loosed. Uh, y'all are loosed, you plural are loosed, or y'all are being loosed. And uh, lastly, they are loosed, or they are being loosed. Okay, so there you have it. We now have a new, our second set of verb endings. Now I couldn't, uh, I couldn't leave without talking about deponents, could I? Um, deponents, which if you remember from back last semester, deponents are words that are they're fake, they're fake verbs. It's fake news. Uh, we have fake verbs. Deponents. Deponents basically are 
dressed up like they're middle or passive, but they're actually active in meaning. They're like sheep and they're like wolves in sheep clothing. You know, they look like passive sheep, but in their hearts, they're active wolves. Um, so uh, they look. A deponent is a a word that looks like it's middle or passive ending. So it, it takes middle or passive endings, but it's not really middle or passive. It's only pretending to be middle or passive. These are verbs. Now, again, don't get me wrong. There are actual middle and passive verbs. Don't, don't think that everything with one of these endings is deponent. That's what beginners often do. They get so fixated on deponents that they forget that there are actually verbs that are uh, legitimately middle or are legitimately passive. Um, but... Um, there, there is a, this other group that are very frustrating of verbs that look, they, they have the endings. They've got the look, you know, they've got the middle or passive look, but they're actually not middle or passive. They're active in meaning. And the way that I, I, the way I get you in the door here is that if you go to your vocab list or if you go to the dictionary and the dictionary has it as uh, an oh my ending on it. So if there's an oh my ending in the dictionary, you can think, oh my, this word is deponent, okay? Um, that'll get us started, okay? So like erkamai. Erkamai means I come or I go. Um, in its dictionary form, I'm looking up this word in the dictionary. Erk, oh my. Oh my, this word's deponent. In the dictionary, it has oh my, so it's deponent. This is not a real middle ending. This is not a real oh my ending. Uh, this is a pretend passive ending, Okay? Um, same thing with ginomai. These are very important verbs, by the way. Very important verbs. And yet, omai, oh they're deponent. And I know they're deponent because in the dictionary, they don't have an omega on the ending. Most verbs have an omega uh, ending in the dictionary. But these words have an omai oh in the dictionary, and you say omai. Oh this word is deponent. Okay, hopefully that jogs a memory from last semester. So the key, the key to spotting a deponent for now, okay, for now, or, or shall I say, for the present tense. The key in spotting a deponent in the present tense is how the word looks in the vocabulary or dictionary. Um, if it has an omega, uh, then then if, if a word has an omega in the dictionary and you, you find it having an omai somewhere, that's a real omai. But if in the dictionary it has an omai from the very vocabulary form, then it's, it's a pretender, it's a deponent. Okay, this chapter does end with giving you for the first time, the middle and passive uh, infinitive. So the infinitive we've seen so far for a very long time is luane, uh, to loose, or, or even better, to be loosing, to get that present flavor. Um, but I've been warning you now for some time that there are other infinitives, not of this ain. Um, and so for the first time, let's look at uh, lues thigh. So lues thigh, six out of the seven infinitive endings end in I, by the way. The th I think hopefully pretty soon you're going to realize that this st, this st is a middle or passive, the sigma theta is a middle or passive kind of thing. Um, intuitively, you'll, you'll pick it up. Um, and so the infinitive, the, the middle or passive infinitive has a st in it. Um, so if luane means to loose, then thy means to be loosed. You could say to be being loose, but that's just bad English. But that would get the continuous flavor in there. The middle is going to look the same, Lewis thigh. And that's going to mean, you know, whatever the middle is. If, so look in the dictionary, see whether the word has a special meaning in the middle. Um, it could be deponent, in which case just transit actively. Uh, but if it is a middle, then you're going to have to figure out what kind of a middle it is. Is it a to loose oneself uh, kind of thing? Maybe it is. Well, this has been an introduction to the middle and passive voices uh, in Greek, and particularly to the second set of endings. Luomai, lue, luetai.